On my desk, I have two toy action figures. One is a laughing Buddha and the other is Sigmund Freud. When I was in New York doing my graduate work, I took a class at Union Theological Seminary called Depth Psychology and Theology. Our professor, Anne Ulanoff, a well-known Jungian analyst, led us on a fascinating expedition into psychoanalytic theories and their connection to theological beliefs. And this class sparked, prompted, affirmed a belief of mine that I don't think I'd ever really put words around. It was that everything that I was seeking in my life with God, my desire to be a priest, anything about my faith, anything I was trying to glean from a religious tradition, all of those desires and questions were as personal as they were universal. And those questions of meaning and purpose and belonging flooded through so many disciplines beyond religion or theology. Maybe that was the class when I began reading Sigmund Freud, whose writings really captured me and who I discovered had an influence on our popular understandings of psychology that I had barely known up until that point. Anyway, somewhere he wrote this, and I'm paraphrasing. A person's interior reality is what matters most. It matters far more than what's going on around you externally. Whatever it is that you're feeling inside, well, that determines almost everything. In this conversation today, I am talking with Mike Coe who is a leadership coach and who connected with me through the network of the Georgetown program that we both attended. I share an extensive summary of his professional experience in the introduction to our conversation, but what I want you to know now is that he partners and supports people and teams as they navigate internal realities, as they navigate transitions, meaning the internal responses and reactions that you and I have to external change. What was fascinating to me is that he works primarily with veterans because of his experience moving out of a 14 year career in the Air Force and what a shift to his understanding of his identity that was. Mike uses humor and the framework of improv to help people be more present and embodied. And together we talk about some of the shared external changes in our own lives, like divorce, that caused us to navigate some major internal changes to our understanding of who we are. All of that about our internal realities is why I keep Buddha and Freud on my desk, because they are little reminders to me to look inside that when the change is happening on the outside, whether I think they are good or not so good, but when those external changes just feel too daunting or too big, what is that still small voice inside encouraging me to pay attention to? I hope my conversation today with Mike prompts resonance, laughter, and some encouragement for you to look inward and get curious about what your still small voice is asking these days. Okay, now on to my conversation and I hope you enjoy it. Hi there, Mike Co. Aloha, Ariane Rice. How are you? I'm very good. It is not often that I get aloha as a greeting. So that is lovely to hear. Um, I want to just say a little bit about who you are before I launch into some of my questions. Um, First of all, I'm really grateful that you're making time. You and I have just recently been connected uh, through the Georgetown Institute for Transformational Leadership. And you, um, it seemed to me, joyfully accepted my invitation to other leadership coaches who wanted to be on this podcast and have some intentional conversation around thinking about what it is we feel and how we work with other people in doing that. So thank you for making time and being here. You're welcome. So here is a little bit about Mike. Mike is a master leadership, creativity, and life career change coach. 
He works with leaders who want more creativity, creatives who want more leadership, and anyone navigating change in their life. He specializes in coaching veterans, military, and spouses through their inner transition as they re-enter civilian life. And he uses principles from improv, martial arts, and mindfulness to create practical skills clients can immediately use to have an easier, less difficult life. Who doesn't want that? (laughs) So I will tell you you as my first question, and then I'll stop talking. What most drew me in to those few sentences, because, you know, it's impressive and, and also not part of my world, the military and veterans and all of that. But what really drew me in was that phrase, working with them through their inner transition as they re-enter civilian life. So I want to ask you, by way of getting started, what drew you to want to work with people on their inner life? (laughs) I would love to say that there was some grand plan that I came up with 15 years ago and said, I've got it. Uh, This is what I'm gonna do with the rest of my life. And with so many things, that's not how it actually happened. I, this all started because I was trying, I was going through my own transition out of the, the Air Force, and I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I didn't understand completely what was happening. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of research. There was research out there, but there wasn't a whole lot of application of it with the military. And so, yeah, it just kept it, it kept moving and moving. And then, in the process of of working on my own inner work, my own healing. I started to realize, hey, like this, this, this work that I'm doing could actually help, could also help uh, veterans. Like it's universal. The, a a number of the lessons or most of the lessons that I've learned, they're universal and can be applied to all, all humans. So yeah, that's how it all all got started. About that story, like the personal story of Mike. So yeah, I mean, that's a long... (laughs) Exactly. Do you want to start back from when I was born? I, know, like to, every single person I grew up of started... humble parentage in a small town <laughs> in Pennsylvania. Well, or... you know, here's the thing. Most everybody that starts that talks with me, I kind of want to get into the good stuff right away, right? So we'll fast forward. So get tell me where the good stuff starts. What's the part of the story that made because those of us that go into this kind of work where we want to work with other people on their interior life. I thoroughly believe that it's because of exactly what you said. We had our own experience of working through some pain, perhaps trauma, perhaps, you know, there's a lot of words could be used there, but definitely change probably prompted by some suffering. Oh yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. See? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> what? And you get to share whatever piece and part of this that you feel is appropriate for this conversation, but Yeah. What's that for you? That for me is at the 13, about the 13 year point in my career in the Air Force, recognizing that the Air Force was not my dream anymore, that it was something else. I didn't know exactly what that might be. And I tried to get out of, I had a couple year contract, um, it's just the way that it it, it worked out. Uh, I had moved to another base. And when that happens, you have to sign a contract that says I will serve a couple more years. So I was, I felt trapped and I was in Washington, DC. I was working at the Pentagon, which if you've never been there, it's 25,000 people in a concrete office building. And yeah, there's windows, but some of the offices don't have windows. It's very... Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of fluorescent lighting. Mm -hmm. And I felt trapped. I felt like uh, I felt all this uh, pressure in my body. I wasn't eating. I wasn't taking care of myself. Uh, You know, I was partying and drinking too much and it just wasn't how I wanted to be. So they, I asked the Air Force politely and they said, no, politely. And then a couple months later, I kept asking, 
And uh, they, they wouldn't let me out. They said, try again in a year. That was cool. what they actually said. So I suffered through that experience and also had the worst job that I had in the Air Force, uh, was moving through that at the same time. Uh, what and was then the job? It was working for, I was like two people removed from the Secretary of Defense on the special projects team. And we were tasked to find $40 billion of savings in the across the Department of Defense over a five-year period. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, it was staff work. I wasn't, I wasn't leading anyone, which is part of the reason why I loved the Air Force was mm-hmm. opportunities to lead. It just wasn't my, it wasn't my thing. Mm-hmm. And the people that I was working with for the first time, I, I, I just wasn't gelling with the people that I worked with. It, it, yeah, it was just, it was very difficult. And I was, it was, I was new to the Pentagon. I'd never worked there before. And they said, Hey, you're going to go work in this office. And I said, okay. But I didn't know how to get around the building. And it was, mm-hmm. you know, that that's okay. It's not. I a big mean, deal, if I can imagine of- like a less warm and friendly environment to work in, I would imagine something akin to the Pentagon. Yeah, the people in it are great, but the system, the machine is like, it's just, you know, fluorescent mm-hmm. lighting and it's hard floors. There's angles. It's not a yeah. lot of, there's not a lot of softness there. Right, right. Can I, can I Which, ask you a question yeah. that maybe mm-hmm. is a little bit even earlier in the story? Because sure. I don't, you know, we kind of relate to things that we know. I certainly know what it is to dream about doing something. I certainly had a dream about what it was, believe you know, to be an Episcopal priest, which sounds like the farthest thing removed from somebody that works in the Air Force. But at the same time, they're two institutions and they're they're both institutions that are connected with um, a doctrine of belief and yes. institutions that are connected with serving a purpose greater than oneself. So I can relate to the idea of, you know, something not being your dream when you go towards that. But what was the dream? What, what did you, I mean, I don't really know why somebody joins the Air Force. Yeah. So why, so is that the question? Why did I? Yeah. Like what was the dream that propelled you to do that? Well, um, I wanted to, the reason I joined the Air Force, I did ROTC in college, Mm. It's reserve officer training corps. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for individuals to learn how basically they it's like taking boot camp for officers and they they pull it apart and it's four years long with different things that you have to do along the way kind of like going to the air force academy except we got to have fun all the time (laughs) (laughs) and not have to wear a uniform all the time like they did so i joined because i needed a true story i walked into my high school guidance counselor's office miss annette thompson still remember her name and i i looked at her and said hey I need a, a scholarship. We have some money, but we can't afford to send me to the college I want to go to. And w- I want, I'm, I'm efficient, you know, so I want one, just one application that'll give me all the money instead of 10 applications with, you know, a thousand dollars each or mm-hmm. whatever it was. And she said, oh, well, we, we have this ROTC thing, the Air Force and the Army and the Navy. And I was like, okay, great. She gave me an application. I filled it out and sent it in. And thank God, I, I applied to the Army as well. And the Army turned me down. Oh. And I didn't understand the implications of that until I got into active duty and worked with the Army, who I love. There's no one better to defend me or our okay. country. Okay. And it's a different mindset of which it just is not my style. Gotcha. Uh, much more the Air Force. So thank, I thank God that uh, I didn't end up in the army because it would not, it would have been been even worse. (laughs) No, it's terrible. It would have been terrible. Well, 15 years, that's how long you were in the Air Force? Uh, I did 14 years active duty, and which meant full-time. And then I switched over to the reserves, which, or the Air Force Reserve, which is uh, uh, part-time, one month a year required, still working at the Pentagon, uh, at least a month a year. And usually it would end up being about three or four months that I that I worked there. So in the military, because I'm wondering if you were the sort of person who was kind of always attuned to your inner life. Yes. Yeah. And was that something that you found supported and a part of the culture of where you were? <laughs> <laughs> 
I always joke that if the uh, military wanted us to have emotions, they would issue to them like a pair of pants or boots, a <laughs> pair of boots, uh, which I, and I joke about that. It's not actually that it's not oppressive. Right. But overall, the system, it's a it, it's a system and the system is designed to train individuals how to uh, go to battle and mm -hmm and potentially kill someone mm -hmm. like there's a mindset change that happens yeah, in boot camp that's like so. i'm gonna if i have to i'm and i was you know i was drinking the kool-aid in my 20s and i would have run into a brick wall for my country i mean mm -hmm. I, not a brick wall anymore but maybe if there were pillows and something not because of the pain but because like what's the what's the point you know for the right. sake of what am i going to do this well, I mean, you said like it's a system that that's funny, like would put pants on an, on an emotion, like, me, you know, see it as a thing to be trained and dealt with. But and or y yes, and and <laughs> every workplace system wants to deny the fact that there's an emotional reality. I think I think a lot of workplace systems, I think I, this is what I discover in coaching is sometimes the reticence a person might have to say like, the same like emotions that operate in your life outside work are operating at your life inside work. And that, that inner life, those feelings are still a part of the build the relationship building and the work you're trying to get done in the, your office building and office system. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I have so many clients who have come in, not every, but many come in and say, uh, I have this problem at work, but everything at home is fine. Mm. And uh, if you could just help me with this work thing, it'll mm -hmm. be it, like, can we get it? Do you have like an express thing that yes. we could do it in like three weeks or maybe a month? And so I say, okay, sure. And I play along. It's a game we all play because uh -huh. I've done this too. Uh -huh. And then maybe a couple months later, they're like, oh, it's connected. Like, I don't have an actual work self and a home self. I just have a self. Oh, and then, then I'm like, okay. And then we get into the real work. So when did that happen for you? That connection? If the, if you were working in this system that was oppressive and yet you weren't, or were you at odds with the system because you were so paying attention to your inner life? No, I didn't pay attention to, I mean, I was aware. Um, when was that shift for me was probably, I was living in Hawaii and I had just gotten divorced. And that was like going through the process of the divorce. And uh -huh. I started, that's when I started therapy. I worked uh -huh. with this guy. He was like Yoda or a wizard. Uh -huh. I Jerry, the therapist. Yeah, yeah, he was amazing. He got me started on that path. And that's when things really, because I, I didn't, I had, I had awareness of my inside, but I didn't understand what the messages were a lot yeah. of the times. So he helped me. That was the very start for me of how do I, how do I navigate this? Here are some tools that I can use to help me navigate this inner landscape because I don't know, you know? Okay. So, you know, we basically just met each other. So I don't want to ask you about all the details of your personal life. And yet as somebody who's also been divorced, and that was also a major change that one I had to navigate and had a huge awareness of my inner life and maybe what my inner life had been trying to tell me, mm -hmm. you know, long before that divorce. Can you even speak to some of the things you learned about your feelings and your inner life in the divorce process that really don't have anything to do with the marriage itself, but have to do with who you are and who you are now, like what you learned from that in my line of work, I will also say the, the priestly religious line of work, I think a lot of people really struggle and it's, this is beyond just priests and maybe this is true in military and maybe you've, you've experienced this in other realms. There's still a lot of shame connected with divorce and a lot of just such fear, such fear of such a monumental change in, in your life and your identity that I think when those of us who go through it and come out on the other side of it. It is an incredible learning experience. Like, dare I say. Dare, dare. Dare I say, I wouldn't change a thing. Like, I oh, would hell yeah, I wouldn't right? change a thing. Right, like, right. My uncle gave me some of the best advice I ever got. Okay. When I was going through that. And 
he said, he said, Mike, sometimes you have to get married so that you can get divorced. Wow. I, I was like, what the hell does that even mean? You know, I'm like in the midst because I'm in the, in the, in the, the mud. I might have to and title I, the episode. Sometimes you have to get married. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And like, I use that now in, I use that with clients. I use it with myself because it's a lot of things. Like sometimes we have to experience something just so that we can then decide like, oh, this isn't the right thing for me. So what were some of the real, what were some of the learnings that you still keep with you from that time? Yeah. So uh, there's a guy named Chris Germer, who's another, he's, I I don't know what he calls himself exactly, but let's say he's a coach or he's a wise person. And he says, uh, his, his thing is that uh, compassion is the antidote to shame. Mm -hmm. And I, so I take that off a little bit and say that, yes, I I 100% believe that's true. And that's my experience. And I think humor and laughter is an even uh, greater antidote because it's in those times where we can't have compassion for ourselves necessarily, or I can't have it for myself. But if I can watch something that makes me laugh, or Mm -hmm. I can go outside and see something that um, makes me laugh, then it, it opens up, it gives me a little bit more ease. I get a little bit more flow. It's a discharge of the energy. It's a way to get the energy out. So even when I can't have compassion or any compassion for myself, which now is pretty rare, but it does happen. I find something to make me laugh. And that is my number one. Well, yeah, number one thing. Um, I would say tied with the fact that uh, my my ex-wife is the reason that I got into therapy and then popped out the other side and realized seven months later, I need to get divorced. Uh So I, I, even those people that maybe it doesn't work out, there can still be appreciation. It took me a couple of years to get that, but it was like, Oh yeah. Without her pushing me to go do that, I wouldn't have realized we just weren't a good fit. It just, we're not bad people. How old were you when you got married? 30. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know what, though? I don't know, but part of me thinks like I was a good fit at that particular moment in my life. I got married at 24. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, it's hard for me to even relate to the person who was that person back then. I'm just, I'm completely different now. I know I'm completely different now. I don't, um, I don't know. Yeah. This is the path that I ended up taking so I, you know I don't know how it would have looked otherwise okay so you met you 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 got to humor and you talked about you know humor to you is equivalent you can equate it and it's even more important for you in terms of an antidote to shame and something that helps you re-engage with what is good and what is good for you I've got to believe too you cycled through a vast emotions of that feeling wheel when you were yeah. kind of, when you were going through, you know, the ending of a relationship in such a significant way and navigating such a huge change, because it is such an identity shift when we go from being married to single. So, so what's, what are the things that you learned in that identity shift? Because that's a part of what you're doing now has to do with an identity shift. So people might even be like, well, what does that mean? Identity shift? Right. So every time that's a, that's a, a, I I approach this through uh, change and transition. So anytime we, which in our society change, the words change and transition get used interchangeably a lot. And I'm going to define it, or this is how I define it. So change is the external event that happens um, in our life. Uh, Getting married, having a a baby comes into the family, um, could become becoming grandparents uh, promoted at work, let fired, let go, um, death in the family. All those things are are external changes. Actually, the the biggest, the greatest example of this right now for us was uh, March of 2020. COVID was a huge change event. All of a sudden, overnight on whatever it was, March 12th or 14th, uh-huh. the world changed, and and it was. Uh, the next day it was, oh, oh crap. Or immediately it was, how do we, how do we, we've had this change. And as a result of that, I have to be different now in my life. I have to reorient myself Uh in an inner reorientation as a result of the change that happened. 
So the transition is actually the inner reorientation that a human goes through as a uh, res result of or response to an external change. Okay, let me just so transition being the inner reorientation. I love that word. The inner reorientation to an external change. Yes. And that is a process, right? That's how. Yes, you it, that. it is a it is a process. And that everybody, every human goes through the same process. It's different steps, right? It's like, it's all Kool-Aid, but it's different flavors or it's uh -huh. all potato chips, but they're all different. Uh -huh. uh, boy, I picked two really healthy options there, huh? Well, How about they're all carrots and maybe they're different colors? Uh, fine, but now I'm getting hungry for snacks. Um, so, <laughs> so wait, I want to, because like all of a sudden I'm just like, man, we are getting all navigating some like unbelievable transitions these days, aren't we? Because oh, like, we are. the external yes. changes like don't stop. Like they haven't stopped since 2020. Uh, yeah, yeah. The internet has also uh, changed things significantly. And I'm 47 years old. So I've lived through, and I was an information technology officer in the Air Force. So mm -hmm. I managed a lot and did hands-on with um, a lot of this starting in uh, the late uh, 1990s. So uh, just seeing that how much the internet has sped things up and things are changing so fast that we as humans, we can't quite keep up with it because it's not, it's just not possible unless a person, it's just, it, it, it's very challenging to keep up with all the, the change mm -hmm. because our bodies were not just evolutionarily, we're not designed to be able no. to do that. The, so if you get back to that question, when, mm -hmm. if somebody says to you like, okay, so I get it. Like there's this internal process I'm supposed to go through when mm -hmm. an external change happens. What yes. do you mean about my identity? Like, what, what does that mean? Don't, don't I have multiple identities anyway? Like I'm a mom, I'm a priest, I'm a coach, I'm doing this, but you know, I have, you know. Yeah. So a couple, uh, yeah. So what about identity? Well, most, I, I would argue that a vast majority of Americans do not understand the identities that they have because a lot of the identities they picked up as children and don't even realize that they have. Oh, that's, and that's I mean, a huge, yeah. huge thing. And every human has some kind of hidden pieces of their identity that was painted on them. I call it painted on mm -hmm. because a, a society or an institution, and it doesn't mean it's bad. It's mm -hmm. There's no good or bad. Right. It's easy and hard. Yeah. Certain things will make our lives easier or an action will make our lives more difficult. It That's it. It's, yeah, not, you know, easy. Well, it's not good or bad. No value you, judgment. You know the phrase uh, perennial wisdom? Is that something that ever comes up in your world? It's like it's a sort of flower like... that rises out of the ground like a perennial. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's just wisdom, you know, that cycles through traditions and history yes. and culture. Yes. And so exactly the way, like, that's a beautiful way that way, understanding identity in that way connects very much with the Brene Brown work that I teach and facilitate a lot that has to do with wrestling with our stories and understanding where vulnerability as a, as a term got painted onto us as an identity we want to deny, right? Because we think yes. it means we're weak. It thinks it means we're over-emotional. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of thinking about it was imprinted on you. It was painted on you. The image that came to mind immediately was like a mother duck and our ducklings. Like, yeah, cause you know, like they get imprinted. <laughs> yeah. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Like that's yes. And that's, it's, and there's no it. value judgment with it, mm -hmm. but we don't yeah. know how to identify it. So was it, was it when you're, you were feeling oppressed in that system in the military that you started to wrestle with that? Or was it also navigating the change of the divorce or was it all of these things and just one of those aspects of growing? It was all of those things. And when I was uh, just about to get divorced, I was considering leaving uh, or we were about to sign the paperwork. It was a, to, uh, to get divorced. And I was considering getting out of the Air Force and staying in Hawaii and doing I don't know what. I had actually decided that I was going to do that. I told my friends on us and it was on a over the weekend. So we we celebrated on Sunday and then Monday came along with maybe not just a hangover, uh, a realization that I can't, this is too big of a shift for me. I can't get divorced and change my career yeah. and change. So it was too much. And it was like, uh, I jumped over the fence and then got scared and then came back over and said, okay, I'm going to stay in the Air Force and let I'll, uh -huh. I'll take that assignment to Washington, D.C. 
Uh huh. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I, I had a similar thing too. I had, I put the brakes on a doctoral program. Oh. I was sitting with someone because the person really was looking at me like, so you're going to get divorced and start a doctoral program at the same time. It's like, yeah, I, I can do it. It'll be fine. Cause I was just yeah. trying to deny. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wasn't, I hadn't quite given myself permission to be aware of just what a monumental change it was. Yeah. So, yeah. And I want to normalize that in our society, that language. That's part of my thing is to normalize it so that everybody, it's just a fact of life that we're going through a transition because pe people will see it in life and it's talked about, but there's not a connection between, oh, a midlife crisis is a transition. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, you know, Jerry here just went out and bought a uh, uh, $100,000 sports car when he turned 45. Mm -hmm and he's struggling, you know, cause like we substitute things and think mm. this will make me happy when the external thing isn't the problem. It's the internal reorientation brought about by change. What reorienting did you need to do? What's the reorienting people? Some of it, I'm like, oh, I, maybe this is an obvious question, but I don't think it's an obvious question. What some of the identity shifts and transformations people have to walk through when they're moving from that system that's very mm -hmm. structured and the military to like I, I was reading on your website the, the different people talking about working with you and somebody said part of this change was getting it was getting easier to go to the grocery store <laughs> and and so I thought to that's myself, right yeah but but I bet there's something to that that has to do with the cultural shift that I'm not even aware of or something I don't know so what was the question and all that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be sorry. I just lost no. track. What? But what? See, I things... laughed and then I got centered and then I was like, uh, where oh were we? <laughs> Back in the moment. Um, what are the things that people have to navigate? What is hard? Oh, yeah. What are all those internal transitions they're navigating? Yeah. Well, it's different for everyone, but basically it's, uh, let me stay on this what are it's different for everyone it could be well, what relation... are some of the themes i bet that you oh the themes yeah oh uh relationship to uh to a job family um having to do something that you weren't planning because having to do something that they weren't planning the individual wasn't planning to do but that they have to do like covid oh, yeah. um how I don't feel safe right now. How do I feel safe again? Mm. I don't feel free. Mm -hmm. um, I can't do this. How do I get myself to a point where I believe in myself again? Because mm -hmm. all that stuff gets quest thrown into yeah, question. Yeah, I know. One of the things, I mean, I've experienced myself personally, and then I think bears repeating is those identities that get painted on us and the ways in which we use them to operate in the world like work for a really solid period of time. And mm -hmm. then they stop working because the external changes, I don't know, we start brushing up against them as we get older. And in some of those ways in which those identities used to serve us start making our lives more difficult <laughs> because we, you know? Yeah, I would, I would, yes. Yeah, there were strategies to, um, I, I look at them as that we all have, a, we all have a strategy to keep ourselves safe when we don't feel safe. It's a, it's a safety mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's where do, where does my attention go? Where do I send my attention? And that will, uh, yeah, it'll work for a really long period of time. The body will actually constrict and tighten in different areas, uh, for anywhere from the eyes all the way down to the, uh, like the bathing bottom of the bathing suit area. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And that can hold my experiences, not just myself, but other humans like that will hold for an extended period of until like, say, 35 to 40. And it's that chronic tension, the things start to break down more. I mean, that's part of the reason with I think with athletes, it's not just that they're getting older. It's that this chronic tension has finally their body is starting to say enough. Um, I can't hold this tension anymore yeah. and physical sickness, illness, heart attacks start to come in. So you mentioned, you know, yeah, the body and what you and I would say is somatic awareness or yes. an embodied presence. Yes. Or embodied somatic or embodied. Yeah. So 
I didn't really know the word somatic. I don't think I even knew it until I entered that Georgetown program. And it's I, I learned somewhat, but you, this is a huge part of the work you do as well, right? The yes, somatic. connecting, yeah, yeah, the somatic and the embodied, how we uh, how we sit and how we stand impacts how we uh, how we go through and experience life. Well, what you're making me realize, so let's say at least half the people listening to this podcast are like either religious professionals or people engaged in faith practice, you know, religion of some kind. So as okay. a as a, a priest person, I do a lot of embodied things, right? I have very specific postures I do. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm doing different things in a worship service, or we all know postures such as kneeling, um, you know, even clasping our hands or sitting for meditation. Yet I can tell you in my um, formative formation and training, no attention was paid to somatic awareness or mm -hmm. what changes in our body, even when we move into different positions, or even when we take the time to become aware of what is happening in our body. And the Brene Brown work I do starts with talking about, well, how do you feel vulnerability in your body? How do you feel shame in your body? So can you talk about what brought you into that somatic aware, you know, why, why did you connect with that? Like, what was it in your story that got you there? A friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to this workshop. It was a couple months. Um, so I had gotten off uh, the full-time military I started at uh, University of Georgetown coaching program. And a month later, a friend of mine from class said, hey, I'm going to this thing. I Strozzi Institute sounds pretty cool. And it's it was local. They were happened to be in town in Washington, D.C., or the, the suburbs in Arlington, Virginia. And I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds whatever. I don't know. I'm just saying yes to everything. Yeah. Try it all out. So I went and it was it was amazing because I'm also an improviser. And so the same ideas of being present to life or to on stage were the exact same things they were talking about in the, the, the Strozzi somatic work of how can we invite more uh, presence and what the hell does presence. I've mm -hmm. cursed several times. I apologize talking to a, no, that's fine. Using the, hell and all this so oh that's so funny no i had an earlier guest on and we talked about how we first bonded in georgetown because we dropped like 10 f-bombs so please oh. don't worry about it at all <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and i went and i was like oh i already know this like i get this stuff it's just in a, it's a different application or it's different practices to get to the same place mm -hmm. of how can i be present so i was like okay great and then uh, we had a, a small piece of it, like maybe four hour chunk of it at uh, continued a couple months later at the program. And then I signed up for uh, a, a course, a four day course. And that was like, it was, that's what really got me to see, oh, there's really something to this, uh, this, this presence work, because I had a felt like sense of, of all this energy that, I, or all this tension that I had stored released at the end of those four days. And that was pretty awesome. And I was like, oh, hmm, I so could do for some more of this. If somebody's listening to this right now, yeah, what's a way you would get them in tune with all this becoming a little bit more aware of what's happening in their body? Yeah. So I do that. The great, great question. I do that. Um, I, cause again, I teach, I teach it's, 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 um, things can be made, uh, easier or more difficult. Uh -huh. So I, I tell people to sit in your chair and try and tight. If you're sitting in your chair, tighten every muscle that you can in your, in your whole body, uh -huh. and then try and reach down and touch your, tie your shoes. You can't, I'm trying like, to do this and I cannot yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not impossible, but it's pretty freaking hard. Yeah. So now if we can invite a little bit of space, just take a few deep breaths just kind of let that maybe mm -hmm. shake out some of that tension mm -hmm. and then just, you know, ease into bend over and tie your shoes. Oh yeah. It's so much easier. And so that's, that's just a quick way to experience what is it like to have tension and try and do a basic task. And what is it like to have a little bit more, a little bit more ease and flow mm -hmm. and do that same basic task. Don't you feel or has it been your experience that people are also really disconnected 
from their body. Like you're there coaching them and you ask them a question and they'll tell you something and you're like, yeah, you know, when you talked about it, like you just started shrinking, like under the weight right. of what yeah, you were talking like, about. And they're like, I did. And you're like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Like your whole body told me you were not excited yes. about what you were telling me. Yeah. But that's, yeah, like I see. but I learned a lot. I mean, I, I became a lot more aware of that when I started learning about that whole somatic awareness. Yeah. It's, it's, um, a lot of you because it's not uh, it's not valued in our society. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not that it's not valued. It's that we're over indexed towards the brain and towards the mind. And the the scientific revolution has been wonderful and fascinating and awesome. And I mean, I'm a scientist, so it's not all about the head. There's this yep. whole other thing below the neck. It's the the body is not just a transport system for our cognitive thinking brain. Uh -huh. It's actually a whole system that all works together to uh, work. It, and it, it, yeah, it, it's the whole thing has to work together. If the whole thing works together, it's a lot easier than just the brain being this thing that's carried around by the body. The body has a purpose. Yes, the body and the feelings. <laughs> they all yeah, yeah, exactly. Purpose. Yeah, yes. And you're Thinking right. And we feelings get... and, and body sensations, which we all experience because uh, the sayings are in our language. I was so angry, I couldn't see straight. That's a thing that actually happens. People right. get so mad, they squeeze around the eyes. They physically, they can't actually see straight. They experience the world differently. And yeah, I was so sayings. angry, my head was going to explode. Yeah, because that's what it feels like. Exactly it feels like it's going to explode. Like. Yeah, huh. Okay, you've mentioned it, and it's also a big part of what you do, so... Mm -hmm. I love, I, I, you know, I know a little bit about improv just because before the calling to be a clergy person, I was in the performing arts and had that calling and that was a All right. part of that. Um, and I certainly love watching, um, yeah, I've been to Second City and um, is that the one in Chicago? That's the one in Chicago, right? Yeah, there's, yes, yeah, that's one of them in Chicago. Yeah, that's okay, the, so, the main one. All right. So tell me Biggest about one. improv and how like improv is a part of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the universe provides, you know, I grew up watching <laughs> Saturday Night Live and as a kid and I thought, oh, I could never do that on stage. I'd really like to, uh, is what it progressed to by the time I was in my mid-20s. And I actually did improv, but I didn't know that it was improv. It was some murder mystery dinner theater and I was one of the uh -huh. performers that I did a couple of them. And we had a scripted part and then in between while they were eating, they had to figure out who the murderer was and we'd walk around and improvise all these things, backstories. I didn't know that was improv. It was just in between what we did when they ate uh -huh. dinner. So uh, it, it, and then it was like, I think maybe I need to see, to try this improv thing. And I saw a, a show in Chicago and a couple other places. And I was like, yeah, I, I think I want to do this. And that was my gift to myself when I got divorced. I said, I'm finally going to do this thing that I've been putting off for so many, for a number of three, four years. Mm -hmm. And I started doing improv and I was hooked. I I was training three hours a, a week for seven months. Um, what is it that hooked you? I, I felt alive. There was an aliveness to mm. me. That like being, it was being on that knife edge of we, uh, for, for those who don't know about improv, it's, it's getting a, a suggestion from the audience and then performing a, a long form improv, which is what I prefer. And then performing, say, 25, 30, 45 minute show based on that suggestion. And then we create characters, themes and relationships from scratch. There's no planning. It's not scripted. And it's only performed one time. It's like a play that's performed one night only. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then every other show is 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 different. So it's that knife edge of trusting teammates and all working on something together. So what hooked me was teamwork. I felt alive that I didn't I had not felt that way before mm -hmm. with clothes on in an audience with a team, <laughs> all performing on stage and doing this amazing, amazing work. Uh, it was about, and then other stuff too, that I didn't realize at the time, it was about being present. Then I was connecting into my soul mm -hmm. when I was doing this on stage. And, 
um, yeah, just an amazing experience because it is it's an experience yeah there, there's times where on it sometimes there were shows where I would walk on stage and then I would have the most amazing show and it was almost like I blacked out I, I didn't black out right. I was there like I remember things about I remember the entire show but then we get to the end and I'm like what just happened where okay. did that come from and I had really I had uh relaxed enough that I was able to connect to spirit or source or mm -hmm. God or the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that was what was guiding my show. I was not, my head was no longer in charge. It was allowing my intuition to lead. Mm -hmm. And so that's also one of the biggest things for me that I discovered later was that improv connected me, connects humans to their intuition. It connects to their intuition, which is the connection is a connection to spirit to the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's the biggest thing. And I use improv as a means to move through my daily life. Uh, I've embodied it. I practiced it. That's what embodiment means. You practice it enough times. It's in the yeah. tissues. You don't yeah. have to think about doing it, a bit, uh, uh, how to do it. Right. I, this, this conversation's kind of flown by really quickly, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, it has. Um, I'm always amazed at the ways in which I've heard that improv is utilized by people to help build leadership capacities. Oh yeah. Because yeah. it is so about being in the moment and utilizing thoughts, feelings, and behaving mm -hmm. to engage in a meaningful way with whatever's happening and whoever you are paired with or whatever group of people you're with. And it's a mind, my limited understanding it is that mindset of yes and. Uh, it is. It's all about yes and. It's and 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 just to be, I want to be clear about what that means because sometimes there's miss. It's a misapplication or misunderstanding uh -huh. about uh, for for the the listeners. Yes and means I've accepted the reality that something just happened. So if I was on stage uh, and somebody walks in and says, "Let's go rob a bank," in my head I'm like, I don't want to rob a bank, like or so maybe I, or maybe I do, and I, I accept the reality. That person just said something and that influence and it impacts me, it lands on me. And then I respond with something else. I add something to uh -huh. it. So it's not about saying yes to everything that happens. Uh, right, it's right. about saying yes to the reality that this just did happen. And now what am I going to do about it? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. No, and that's, that's why it works really so well with that. every day to practice every day as a practice for how we move through everyday life. Right. You're not life is not scripted. No, it is not. It's accepting the reality in front of you. It's very Buddhist. Yes, except for the Truman Show. But even that, it was scripted, but not completely. <laughs> there was still some improv in that. <laughs> well, Mike Co. One of the things that makes me come alive is having intentional conversations with people who appreciate the value of them and um, are part of helping people navigate inner transitions when all of us are dealing with so much external change. So thank yeah. you for being here and making time. And thank you for the work you bring into the world. And, um, you know, I hope our paths cross again. Yeah, me as well. Thank you so much for having me, Ariane. And uh, yeah, namaste and aloha.